Uh, welcome to the afternoon session. I want to tell you that uh, uh, I'm going to use a baseball analogy because uh, I'm still from East Coast and I had also apologies for the team involved. So one of the questions is who's the most valuable player in the Yankees team? And, um, the most valuable play player is uh, Mariano Rivera because he's a closer. Right? And his job is to come in the end of ninth inning and make sure the game gets won. So it's the, the most critical job, if you know baseball, it's the most, hard, the most critical job as far as I can tell. And David has played the closer for us. You know, problem out of problem, the final word in the bound is David's word. So I'm, I'm always excited to hear David talk about his results. And he's not talking about a very large, rich class of problems, numerical, uh, linear algebraic problems, which I'm sure many of you will find a lot of applications. So. so thanks, Muthu, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, this is a great community uh, using sketching in real life. and. Um, uh, just a disclaimer that I'm one of the co-authors of the uh, optimal uh, distinct elements uh, <laughs> algorithm that was mentioned in the panel discussion as not having uh, any engineering value. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I, I've tried to make this talk, uh, you know, as practical as possible, and please stop me if there are any questions. So, um, sketching is a tool for numerical linear algebra. Uh, so, massive data sets, um, we've talked about them a lot this morning, uh, they occur all over the place, inter inter internet traffic logs, financial data, etc. And uh, we want algorithms to process them, and we want extremely efficient algorithms, so nearly linear time, or sublinear time, and usually it's not possible to do this uh, without uh, allowing both randomization and approximation. Um, so this talk is going to be about uh, linear algebra problems, and we'll start with one of the most basic ones, which is uh, regression. So you have a stream of data, and you want to uh, to study dependencies uh, among the different variables in the data in the presence of noise. And what we'll focus on is uh, linear regression, which is a statistical method to study linear dependencies between these variables in the presence of noise. So um, here is a uh, Simple example, uh, Ohm's law, this voltage is the resistance times the current. You get a bunch of different observations of voltage-current pairs, and you're trying to learn this unknown uh, resistance, um, which is uh, you know, the best slope uh, for this uh, to fit these observations, the linear function that best fits the data. Now, uh, what does best fits mean? So we'll go over different notions uh, in this talk. But um, let me first uh, set up the uh, regression problem uh, more formally. So the standard setting is as follows. Uh, we have one measured variable, um, B. So uh, B might be the voltage in uh, Ohm's law. And we have a set of predictive variables, A1 through AG. So in that example, we just had D equals 1, and A1 would be, uh, say, the current. So we get current voltage pairs. And uh, we have an assumption that uh, there's a linear relationship between the measured variable and the predictive variables. So the relationship is that B um, is equal to x0 plus a1 x1 plus dot 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 ad xd um, plus some noise epsilon. So in the uh, Ohm's law example, we would have uh, we wouldn't have this x0 term. We would just have that the uh, voltage is equal to resistance uh, times the current, and we're trying to learn these unknown values, uh, x0, x1 through xd, which determine a hyperplane that, the, um, uh, that describes this linear relationship. Okay, so epsilon is the noise, which could be adversarial, it could be Gaussian noise, it could be whatever uh, the problem asks for, and we're trying to learn this xi. Now, uh, by a standard transformation of the problem, we can assume that this uh, constant term x0 is equal to 0. So in fact, we're just trying to fit a linear space uh, or a line through the, uh, a line through the origin uh, to the data. OK, so uh, this describes uh, a voltage um, uh, current pair, but we actually have many of these uh, measurements. We make, say, n observations. And so you can write out what regression is in uh, matrix form. So you have this n by d matrix A, 
Um, the different rows of A correspond to the different observations. And you have this uh, vector B, uh, which corresponds to the uh, voltages measured So the, uh, for each of the uh, N observations. And uh, D is the number of these predictive variables. So D was 1 in the Ohm's law example. And what you're trying to do uh, is you're given this matrix A and this vector B, and you're trying to find this unknown vector X star so that A X star and B are close under some uh, notion of closeness. I mean, that's what it means to uh, that the data uh, has this linear relationship. And we're going to consider the uh, over-constrained case which arises uh, a lot in practice when this matrix A is a very tall, skinny matrix, meaning you have many observations. Uh, N is much larger than the number of variables D. And for the purpose of this talk, uh, you can assume that the columns of A are linearly independent of each other, that it has full column rank. OK, so what are some notions of closeness that we can look at between uh, AX and B? So there's the most popular uh, least squares method of regression, where what you're trying to do is find this vector X star in R to the D, so that the Euclidean norm uh, squared of AX minus B is minimized. Uh, so just recall that. Uh, this Euclidean norm squared is the sum over the n observations i of the value that measured bi minus the uh, inner product of the ith row uh, and, and x, so the ith row of a and x. So it's, it's, the, it's this epsilon uh, term for the ith measurement, the noise of the ith measurement squared. Uh, so this has certain desirable statistical properties. It's very often used in practice. Um, but there are actually more uh, robust versions of regression. Uh, so there's what's called the least absolute deviation regression, or L1 regression, where now you're trying to find this vector x star. Uh, instead of minimizing this Euclidean norm, you're minimizing uh, the so-called 1 norm. So uh, it's the sum uh, over these uh, differences um, of the best fit. So you find this x star. So that x star minus the observed variables, the sum of the absolute values is minimized. And this is uh, less sensitive to outliers than least squares. And this is why um, you know, if you can solve this problem efficiently, it can often give you better solutions than uh, least square, the least squares method. OK, so these are the two um, forms of regression we'll focus on. And so just so that you have a you know, very clear picture of uh, what regression is, let's just describe the geometry of regression. So as we said, we want to find this vector x given this matrix A and vector B so that we minimize uh, Ax minus B under some norm. It could be the Euclidean norm or the 1 norm. Uh, so, so, so P just denotes some norm. And uh, the product what is a times x? Well, a is this matrix. And what you can view a times x is as a linear combination of the d columns of a. So I take the first column of a, a star 1. I scale it by the coefficient x1. I add it to the second column of a, a star 2. Scale it by the uh, coefficient x2. And I take this sum. And I'm trying to get this vector, this n-dimensional vector, as close to the vector b as possible. And as I range over all possible x in my minimization, I range over an entire d-dimensional subspace, the set of all linear combinations of the columns of A. And so the problem is equivalent to computing the point in this space, the column space of A, all the linear combinations, that is nearest to B under this uh, norm that we look at, either the Euclidean norm or the L1 norm. OK. So uh, that's the definition of regression. And uh, so in theory, both of these problems can be solved exactly uh, efficiently. So uh, in, say, polynomial time. Um, so you can solve least squares regression via the uh, so-called normal equations. So if you're trying to find this vector x to minimize the 
Euclidean norm of ax minus b, then um, the normal equations say that uh, for the optimal x, you have to have a transpose times a times x equals a transpose b. So I just multiply a by a transpose and b by a transpose. And then this matrix a transpose a is invertible, so the optimal x is just a transpose a inverse times a transpose b. So that's my closed form solution for uh, least squares regression. Um, so that, that works, uh, but it's not very efficient. And one thing we'll talk about is how to speed up solving least squares regression with sketching techniques. Um, what about this more robust version of regression, uh, L1 regression? Well, you can set up the problem as a linear program. And then you can use a simplex method or more theoretical algorithms uh, to solve this um, efficiently. So uh, just believe me that you can write L1 regression as a linear program, a very simple linear program. And solving it in theory would give you polynomial time in uh, the number of observations n and the number of variables d. Um, that's also not very efficient. And we'll show how to use sketching to speed this up. Uh, uh, in practice. Okay, so that leads to the uh, uh, the outline of the talk. I'll first show how to use sketching to speed up least squares regression, then sketching to speed up least absolute deviation regression, and then finally I'll touch upon a related problem uh, called low rank approximation and show how to use sketching in a similar way to speed up solutions for that problem. Okay. So let's dive into uh, sketching to solve least squares regression. This is the uh, minimization problem that we'd like to solve given A and B. And instead of, uh, often with sketching, instead of uh, trying to get the exact solution, we're trying to get an approximate, an approximate solution. So what we want to do is output this vector x prime for which um, the uh, the Euclidean norm, the error measure of ax prime minus b, is at most 1 plus epsilon uh, times the optimal, uh, co the cost of the optimal solution with high probability. This is what we'd like to, uh, to solve. And uh, a very nice uh, sketching idea uh, for solving this, um, introduced by uh, Thomas Salos, is as follows. Um, so what we can do is we can choose a random matrix S. Um, this random matrix S is, a, think of it as a sketching matrix. It's a K by N matrix, where K is much uh, smaller than N. So S is a very wide uh, fat matrix. Um, drawn from some random, random family matrices, I'll specify uh, momentarily. But the idea to solve regression, instead of trying to solve this big regression problem, min x a x minus b, the idea is to first compute s times a, and to compute s times b, and now solve the regression problem on this much smaller instance. So the idea now is that since the regression problem, instead of being n by d, is now only k by d, after I multiply s and a, uh, this the regression problem is sufficiently small that I can now just compute the solution uh, exactly using the normal equations. And so what I can do is I can find the solution to the small problem, x prime, and hope that that solution, which is a d-dimensional vector, is also a good solution to the original uh, regression problem. OK, uh, it turns out that that works for certain choices of sketching matrix S. So uh, this is what we've reduced the problem to. And what matrix S do we use uh, to form this smaller problem of regression? So one matrix is just uh, a random matrix S with IID, uh, independent, identity distributed, normal random variables as the entries. So uh, this is the uh, probability density function of a normal random variable, this uh, bell curve shape. The number of rows of S is only uh, D over epsilon squared. So 
Recall that I said S is a K by N matrix. Here, K is V over epsilon squared. And note, when I compute S times A, the regression problem, instead of being N by D, is now D over epsilon squared by N. I have D over epsilon squared by D. So actually, uh, it doesn't even depend on the number of observations N anymore. This is why it's a much smaller uh, instance of regression. And you can show that this matrix S uh, works. So basically, if you solve this subproblem, you get a 1 plus epsilon approximation to the original uh, regression problem. Um, the only caveat with this is that, so S is this D of epsilon squared by a matrix. You have to compute S times A. You, know, you have a dense matrix times your input matrix. That might be very slow. I mean, it's matrix, matrix, multiplication. Um, so uh, that could be a problem, the bottleneck of this algorithm. Um, it turns out that actually you can use uh, a much more structured uh, random families of matrix, matrices S uh, to, to also solve this problem. So instead of choosing S to be a matrix of IAD normal random variables, I can choose S to be a so-called johnson lindenstrauss transform. So what is this? So these sketching matrices S usually have the following form. Um, they can be factored into the product of three matrices, P, H, and D. And these matrices are random, but they're very structured for allowing uh, fast matrix uh, multiplication. So what is D? D is just a diagonal matrix. Uh, it has zeros off the diagonal. On the diagonal, for each diagonal entry independently, I choose it to be 1 or minus 1 with equal probability. So I can compute d times a vector in linear time just by scaling each of the entries by 1 or minus 1. What is h? Uh, well, so h is uh, known as the Hadamard transform. It's just some fixed uh, matrix, uh, like the Fourier uh, transform, uh, but it only has plus and minus 1 entries. And the nice thing about h is that if I have an n by n matrix h, I can compute a matrix vector product in n log n time very quickly, so almost linear time. And P, all P does is chooses a random small subset of rows of H times D. So if I apply um, a vector here, I compute D times the vector, then H times that vector, and then finally P times that vector. P is just going to choose a sample of coordinates of that resulting vector. So. The point is that S times A can be computed much faster, where A is the input matrix to regression. For each column, I can quickly apply this matrix vector uh, multiplication and therefore compute S times A very quickly, much faster than general uh, matrix multiplication. And it turns out that this sketching matrix S also works just as well as the random matrix uh, with independent normal random variables uh, for achieving a, a 1 plus epsilon approximation. Um, it turns out that actually um, you can do even better than uh, these sketching matrices S that are johnson lindenstrauss transforms. Um, you can use uh, a count sketch matrix S, and that would also give you, uh, uh, would allow you to solve the regression problem. So count sketch is like count min, which we've uh, uh, heard a lot about this morning. Um, you know, the count min matrix. Uh, so if you think of applying count min to a vector, uh, you, you can think of count min as a matrix, a sketching matrix. And it looks very similar to this matrix, except all the minus ones get replaced with ones. So count sketch um, is, a, is a matrix like count min, but I also scale what I hash into buckets by one or minus one. So the sketching matrix S for count sketch is again k by n where k is much smaller than n. You're trying to reduce the regression uh, instance. And now k, instead of being d over epsilon squared, is a little bit larger. Uh, but it's still independent of the number of observations n. So you can set k to be d squared over epsilon squared. And, and the nice thing about this sketching matrix S is that it's really, really sparse. right? So what is the count sketch matrix S? Um, for each of the n columns, I choose a single 
uh, non-zero location at random. And on that location, I put one or minus one with equal probability. So it's extremely sparse. And if I have a sparse matrix S, I can multiply it by a vector very quickly. Because if I try to multiply this by a vector, I just look at the uh, non-zero entries in that vector, and I can compute S times that vector in time proportional to the number of non-zero entries of the vector I'm applying it to. And that's why it's even faster than these johnson lindenstrauss transforms. And uh, it's a, surprisingly, this actually works. Um, so, uh, in, I mean, this, this count sketch matrix has been around in data streams for a long time uh, and been used for other purposes. And it was surprising to me that it can actually be used, if you apply this to regression, uh, solving the smaller regression problem actually gives you a 1 plus epsilon approximation to the original problem. Yeah. Um, so what inspired me, so basically I was looking for algorithms that uh, the time complexity uh, was a function of the number of non-zero entries of the input matrix. For this, I knew that the, uh, I mean, so one way of achieving that time complexity is to have a matrix, sketching matrix, which is really, really sparse. And uh, what kept uh, bugging me is that um, this matrix actually uh, doesn't, have all the properties that a johnson lindenstrauss transform would have. Um, so it's, but it turns out to have enough properties for, for what regression is uh, used for, and that's sort of the surprising part. Um, so, uh, okay, so, so this leads to the fastest known algorithms for v squared regression. Like, I take uh, my input matrix A, I compute S times A, S times B, and I solve the regression on the smaller instance, and that gives me a, a, a solution. So um, uh, that's it for uh, least squares regression. In the next part of the talk, I'm going to uh, discuss something related to how sketching can be used to speed up this more robust version of uh, regression, a uh, one regression. So. Yeah. So, so, so what you're trying to do here, uh, as Muthu points out, is you're trying to, um, uh, the way I formulated it is you're just trying to find an approximate solution to this regression problem. You're trying to find a vector x prime which approximates uh, the cost of the solution. Uh, you might have other uh, uh, goals in mind. Um, you might want x prime to also be close to the optimal vector x uh, under some norm. And uh, so this, uh, you know, wouldn't be guaranteed to give you that, but it would be guaranteed to give you a good fit to the original problem if you just care about the error measure. Okay, so, the, yeah, so the next part of the talk is uh, this more robust L1 regression. And so now, uh, the error measure is uh, the sum of absolute values of the of the noise, so uh, the L1 norm of AX minus B. And the natural uh, uh, goal is to um, find this vector X prime, which gives you a 1 plus epsilon approximation to the cost under this new error measure. So why don't we just try to do exactly the same thing we did for least squares regression. We try to draw this sketching matrix S is wide and fat uh, from a k by n family of matrices for a value k much less than n, trying to reduce the problem size. Then we try to compute s times a and s times b. And we try to optimize in the sketch space. We try to find x prime. Now it's a much smaller problem. If k is much less than n, we can solve this problem exactly using linear programming uh, and hope that this solution is a good solution to the original regression problem. So it turns out that this does not work. Uh, so when I have this uh, L1 notion of closeness, sum of absolute values of errors, then uh, this does not give you a good solution. Um, 
So why doesn't why can't I do this uh, same trick for the squares regression as for L1 regression? Uh, so it turns out that there just don't exist uh, k by n matrices s for a small value of k for which if I were to compute s times a and s times b, solve the regression problems in the sketch space and use that solution uh, as a solution for the original problem, uh, I wouldn't get a good answer. So you can't do this with high probability uh, for this L1 norm uh, error. Instead, what you can do is something which is a much a weaker uh, approximation guarantee. So if you solve this problem in the sketch space with this uh, L1 notion of error, instead of getting a 1 plus epsilon approximation, you get a d log d approximation. So we call it an n by, it's an n by d matrix. Now you have an approximation uh, which is within a factor of roughly d of the best possible approximation. Um, you know, it's not good, right? It's not a 1 plus epsilon approximation. It's also not that bad. I mean, it depends on the smaller parameter d, not the parameter n at least. Uh, but it's not entirely satisfying. Um, now, what matrix S can give this to you? Well, it turns out that a matrix of independent, identically distributed Cauchy random variables will give this to you. Um, now, what is a Cauchy random variable? So it's it's not, um, you know, it's a bit different than uh, the uh, normal random variables, the Gaussian random variables I talked about earlier for these squares. Um, this is their density function. So the, the tails of the Cauchy distribution are much fatter and they're much more slowly uh, decaying, whereas the Gaussian distribution has exponential tails. So it's, it's really not a nice distribution to work with. I mean, you wouldn't want to if you, wouldn't, if you don't have to. Like, uh, you can try to compute the, the mean of this distribution. Um, the integral doesn't converge, doesn't have a mean, has infinite variance. This is like a, you know, a random variable with all the properties that you don't want. Um, how do you generate these? Well, these, these can be generated uh, fairly efficiently. Uh, you can take the ratio of uh, normal random variables um, to get a Cauchy random variable so that you know, I can generate normal random variables pretty quickly using standard packages. This gives me a way of getting Cauchy random variables. Um, okay, so we got a d log d approximation that wasn't entirely satisfying. Um, and what we said is, you know, solving this L1 regression problem, uh, we can solve the problem in the sketch space. Um, and... Uh, but we didn't get what we wanted because we got a d log d approximation instead of a 1 plus epsilon approximation. Okay, but there's a way of uh, bootstrapping this sort of poor solution to get a 1 plus epsilon approximation. And that's what I'll describe next. So we got this poor solution x prime. And what you can do is you can plug x prime back into the original regression problem. And so if I plug that in, then what I'm doing is I'm looking at the L1 norm of AX prime minus B. Uh, so call that vector B prime. That, the L1 norm of B prime is the cost of this solution, uh, uh, X prime. And so I might as well solve the regression problem with A and B prime. Forget about the original B. I found my approximate solution X prime. And I can just plug that in and work with a different B prime. It's equivalent to the original problem. Okay, so that's how we start the bootstrapping. Uh, the main idea behind the bootstrapping is actually uh, the following. So we have this S times A, where S is this matrix of Cauchy random variables. And we do something with it. We do a QR factorization of S times A. So a QR factorization is um, a standard way of deco decomposing matrices, uh, which is implemented in many packages. What it means is that I can write the matrix S times A as a matrix Q times a matrix R, where Q has orthonormal columns. Um, and the really nice property about this is that if I compute the QR decomposition of S times A, I get this matrix R, which is D by D, so, so S times A is K by D, 2 times R is K by D, and 
R is d by d. And it turns out that if I look at A times R inverse, the original matrix A times this matrix R I found in the sketching space, but the inverse of it. If I look at A times R inverse, this matrix is well conditioned in an appropriate sense. Uh, um, uh, so I started with this arbitrary matrix A, and now I found a wall conditioning of it. And I didn't spend that much time, because all I did is I computed S times A. Now I have a very small matrix. I can afford to do a lot of stuff on this very small matrix. In particular, I can compute a QR factorization very quickly on the small matrix. And now I found a wall conditioning of this original matrix by doing something in the sketch space. So I saved time by sort of projecting to the sketch space, doing a lot of work there, and then using that change of basis matrix R there for the original problem. And now it turns out that actually I can solve the L1 regression problem just by sampling now. So uh, if instead of working with A, I work with A times R inverse, I get an equivalent regression problem. And as we said on the last slide, instead of working with this vector B, I work with this poor solution B prime. I have an equivalent problem. And if I just sample rows of observations of this regression instance, then I only have to sample a number of observations that depends on D and not on N. And now I can get a 1 plus epsilon approximation if I sample um, uh, 1 over epsilon squared times D to the 3.5 rows. Um, and so this is how I use, and I solve regression on the samples, and this gives me a 1 plus epsilon approximation for the L1 regression problem. So it's a little bit more complicated than applying sketching to uh, least squares regression. Instead of getting the solution in one shot, you have to use sketching, um, sort of open up the box for uh, how L1 regression algorithms work, and use sketching inside of the box to speed up various steps. And then in this way, you can get a uh, uh, 1 plus epsilon approximation. OK. Um, again, uh, we're faced with uh, the dilemma that the most expensive operation is computing this matrix matrix product, S times A, where S is uh, you know, a matrix of IID Cauchy random variables. So how can we do this quickly? Um, so all the other operations are in the smaller sketch space, and they don't, um, at least in theory, they're, they're not uh, comparable to the time required for computing S times A. Um, so it turns out, just as in the least squares case, that instead of choosing S to be a matrix of IID Cauchy random variables, a very dense matrix, I can choose much more structured uh, random families of matrices S. Um, it turns out that the following matrix S would work for the L1 regression problem. I, I can decompose S as the product of two matrices. One of them is the familiar count sketch matrix, the same matrix we use for least squares regression. The other matrix is a diagonal matrix. And on the diagonal, I put Cauchy random variables. So instead of having a dense matrix of Cauchy's, I just have a diagonal matrix with Cauchy's, which can be applied very quickly to a vector. And then I uh, have the count sketch matrix, which can be applied in time proportional to the number of non-zero entries of the vector. So this is how you can use structured random families to speed up this. Um, you can actually use even more structured, uh, I mean, even better uh, um, random families of matrix uh, of matrices for L1 regression. Um, and this is uh, inspired by a work of uh, Alex uh, Andoni. Um, so instead of choosing this diagonal matrix of Cauchy random variables, if on the diagonal what I do is I choose the reciprocal of an, of a, of an exponential random variable. So uh, exponential random variables have similar properties but slightly better for this application. So if I choose this count sketch matrix times the diagonal matrix with uh, the reciprocal of exponential random variables E1 through EN, then uh, the sampling complexity, the number of rows I have to sample after I well condition the problem is smaller. So this, um, OK. So uh, that's uh, a one regression. Um, and finally, I'm just going to uh, briefly go over uh, a related topic in numerical linear algebra called low rank approximation uh, to a matrix and show how similar sketching techniques can be applied there. So what is low rank approximation? So here you have some matrix A, 
assume for simplicity that it's square, it's n by n. And typically, in practice, A is well approximated by a low rank matrix. Like it might be that your data matrix is actually low rank, but it was corrupted a bit with noise or missing entries, so it got very high rank. But, you know, it at least can be well approximated by a low rank matrix. And uh, so what is a notion of approximation? So you have this input matrix A, and you're trying to find a low rank matrix, say rank K, matrix A prime, so that A minus A prime are close under some norm. What is a natural way of measuring closeness between two matrices? Uh, well, one way is the uh, so-called Frobenius norm of a matrix. So for a matrix C, its Frobenius norm is just the sum of squares of all the entries of, of the matrix, uh, all raised to the one half power. So what I want is a rank K matrix A prime, which is close to A in this Frobenius norm. What does close mean? Well, it means it's at most a 1 plus epsilon factor larger than the best possible rank K approximation to your matrix A. So, AK is the minimizing matrix, uh, the argument over all rank K matrices B of the Frobenius norm of A minus B. And so I'm not exactly finding A sub K, I'm finding matrix A prime for which the cost is at most 1 plus epsilon times the optimal cost. So that's, that's a notion of low rank approximation. So it turns out that actually you could use uh, sketching techniques uh, in a very similar way to solve this low rank approximation problem. So I have this n by n matrix A, which is pretty big, and n, n is, is large. What I can do is I can reduce the number of rows of A. Um, so I can compute S times A, where S is one of these sketching matrices that we talked about. And S, the number of rows of S is only K, where K is much smaller than N. So now I've taken this n by n matrix, s times a is a k by n matrix. Um, and it turns out that if I look at all the rows of a, and I project them onto the space spanned by the rows of s times a. So s times a has only k rows. Its rows define a k-dimensional space. And if I take all the rows of a and project them down to this k-dimensional space, then I can solve this low rank approximation in the sketch space. And when I solve it in the sketch space, uh, I can then uh, lift it back up to the original space. This is a high level description of how sketching can be used here. Um, and if you go through it, so S times A is a very low dimensional space, so all the operations in the sketch space are fast, and the main time consuming operations here are just the simple thing of computing a matrix matrix product again, S times A. And this can uh, be done in all of the same ways as for least squares uh, regression. You can choose S to be a matrix of IID normal random variables, exactly the same matrix. You can choose it to be a fast count and linear cross matrix. You can choose it to be this count sketch matrix. They would all work and give you improving uh, time complexities. Okay, so um, that's how low rank approximation works. Let me just, uh, uh, roughly how it works, let me just conclude. So we gave fast sketching based algorithms for the canonical, pro for very canonical problems in numerical linear algebra, the least squares regression problem, the least absolute deviation, robust regression problem for low rank approximation. And uh, let me just note that uh, sketching, not only does it improve the time complexity uh, of these problems by sort of pushing all the work into a lower dimensional space, it also performs a kind of dimensionality reduction. So I, I can take my original data and I've reduced it to the smaller dimensional space and therefore it leads to more storage efficient uh, solutions. If I'm passing this data to uh, amongst different servers, uh, it le leads to more co communication efficient solutions for these problems as well. So uh, that's all. Thank you.
step to an actual implementation? Yeah, so I think in this, I mean, one of the main things uh, on that line is to try to design a very simple algorithm. Uh, it leads to much easier implementation. And I think, uh, and also not only that, but if you can somehow uh, make some step which reduces the problem to existing uh, algorithms. So if you can just, uh, so, so let me come to a good example for that. So this count sketch uh, matrix for regression. Um, eh, so what do you do for least squares regression? Uh, all you do is you apply this matrix to your input matrix, and you apply it to your input vector, and then you solve regression on this smaller uh, instance. Now you can use whatever algorithms you want in practice to solve your smaller uh, regression instance. And this is so simple, right? Like I can code, I mean, even I can code this up. Like I, I, can multiply, I can multiply a matrix A and this matrix very quickly. And now I've reduced the, the problem instance size. And now you can run whatever algorithms you want. And they'll be more efficient because you have a smaller problem. Um, yeah. Uh, no, well, I mean, this will give improves, an improved solution to least squares regression. So uh, if you can read your data, then you can apply this algorithm. The time complexity is the, the time, the same as the time to read your data. Like if I apply this to a matrix A, I can apply it in time number of non-zero entries of A. Now I've reduced the problem size, and now I can run whatever regression algorithm you want. So if you can read your data, it's... Just to add to that, so, so Petros, Junius, and his students have uh, implemented uh, this. So they had a uh, classification uh, problem. They first used uh, Johnson Linden Strauss uh, for the projection step inside of classification, and they replaced it with this matrix. And they said that on that particular data set, that the projection step performed uh, 10 to 20 times faster. However, for their end goal of classification, Johnson Linden Strauss had additional properties that were useful uh, for other aspects of the algorithm. Yeah. 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 So. No, no, no dependence on condition number.
Yeah, so th that assumption is just uh, if I add the all ones uh, uh, column to the uh, to the matrix, then when I multiply the matrix, so I increase d to d plus one, yeah. I multiply the matrix by x, then since I have an all ones column, I'll get the offset x zero. Oh. Yeah, that's all you do. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's all. Okay. Uh, thank you, David. Sorry, Alex. Really, thank you.